Mike, in trying to really understand how the brain works, one of the processes that we can use to do that is to examine the work that you do right. in terms of correcting brains that have some problems with right. them. So well, what do you do and what can we learn? Well, it's a wonderful, has been a wonderful source of enlightenment to my colleagues and, and myself in our research lives. I mean, think of the, think of the, the, the basis of explanation in the brain. Uh, what accounts for the fact that a child entering school, let's say, is agile or maybe clumsy? Mm-hmm. Or maybe that child at that point in their life is, is destined for great success, this is going to be a, uh, a, a wonderful little uh, ac- a- academician and student, or is going to be an utter failure? I mean, what really accounts for those sorts of variations? So, first of all, it's led me to think of sources of variation that lead a child or lead an adult to a high performance ability, high performance level in their brain, or that limit them. And of course, some of those limitations are, of course, environmental, and some of those limitations, of course, are genetic. Right. But then the second aspect of it is understanding the limitations. You know, how can you drive, and to what extent can you drive a brain in a corrective direction? Well, if you really understood the limitations, you really understood the normal processes, that should always be possible, given the plasticity of the brain, to drive it in a positive and corrective direction. Maybe not completely to normalcy, but, but substantially in that direction. What are some specific examples that you do where you can monitor the clear effect and see it on the brain? Well, you can, you can take a child that's clearly impaired in their ability to operate in the language arts, they're poor in understanding what it is they hear and operating on it. Their, 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 their verbal skills might be limited. They're going to, that's going to set them up for failure or limitations in reading and in, in the facility of reading acquisition. And you can change all that. You can basically change the fundamental resources that limit that. Now you can look in their brains and you can show them in an active reading or an operating language and you show that they're different. They're different. The patterns of activity are different. The way they're engaged in time are different. They're processing information that they receive as listeners or in the operations and reading in a different way. You can, you can see those differences physically, functionally in their brains. The patterns are the same. Dyslexia. Dyslexia, let's say. Or, or an equally large problem in school-aged children is just problems with understanding what the hell's going on. You know, what's a teacher? What's this all about? Teach, you know? Most of the information received in school is verbal. Mm-hmm. And just important that you, that you have limitations in operation and language, right? But these are the two great dimensions that li- limit learning success in children. So now you can say, well, understanding the fundamental origins, the bases of these limitations in the history of this brain, mm-hmm. can I drive the brain to correct these fundamental uh, limitations and empower the child to succeed? And the answer is you can, in the overwhelming majority of these children, drive these brains to a high performance level. So we know that because we can look in the brains, and when we look in the brains, we can restore fast and efficient and refined processing that was lacking before they were trained. What are some of the principles of the training? Because when, if we understand the principles, maybe that'll help us understand how the brain works, if those principles are effective in, in, in this corrective Well, action. when brains are poor resolvers of signals, they basically operate with relative, at a relatively slow pace in analyzing signal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, they necessarily slow down to get the answer right, to maintain control. They're relatively poor at using ongoing information to bias, make predictions, to fill in uh, and to add, to, to strengthen the, re, the, the, the processing of signal by using the powerful syntactic and predictive resources that would normally be in play. You could say it's like a radio that's, that's receiving information that's not quite tuned into the station, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's how they're operating. They have information represented in an imprecise and fuzzy way. It's, it's, it's represented relatively sparsely, relatively incompletely. Now, if you can refine that, strengthen it, complete it by tr- appropriately training the child, right? Now, I might say also, that radio tuned into the station, it's not really, doesn't really do you very much good to try to record it, right? Because it's garbage in and it's garbage out. Every way you use that information, the child is impaired, mm-hmm. right? So impairment in children is never limited to any one level of operation. It's in how the child receives information, how it interprets it immediately. It's in their cognitive use of it. It's in how they use that information to guide thought. It's in how they use that information to guide action. It's in how they use that information to bias and make prediction about what should come next or what goes with what. All of those are impaired, right? They go together. They're not separate processes. There's a linearity to it. They represent 
pro multiple products of a complexly interconnected system in which everything is influencing every, every other damn thing. And if the brain is resolving on the bottom, it's, it's operating with resolution on the top and vice versa, right? It's, it's, they're, they're all products, you could say, of a complicated, unified signal analysis and processing machine. Now, the point is, is that you can fix it in the great majority of individuals that have, and you can look in the brain and see patterns of activity in the trained child, in most trained children, that look like the child has always operated it neurologically with facility. And of course, in parallel, you see the improvements of their, of their behavioral capacities. And we've used the same principles to guide improvements of the operations of old brains versus young brains. Mm. You can actually make an old brain operation. You look a lot more in its activity patterns and its responses like a younger brain. You can drive. We've, we've extensively trained in people that have highly distorted operations like active schizophrenics or patients that have other psychotic or neurological impairments. And you see the results clearly in the behavior but then you can also look at the brain in uh, right. functional nu nuclear magnetic and, resonance and, and, and actually see the, the patterns. Yeah, and, and it's a wonderful source of sort of collective in insight into how the normal system operates. You could say if I could drive the system from where it's at in the distorted state back to a, a no more normal state, right. I understand something, right? Yeah. That's, that's called a, a, a wonderful test of the hypothesis of how it normally <laughs> operates to account for the behavior, right? right? And we see that over and over again. So there's actually one of the things that we begin to understand is how to drive the brain correctively without drugs in a sort of organic way by using these amazingly powerful plas plastic processes to drive brains in corrective directions. And you're going to see this be more and more powerful part of, the, of neurological and psychiatric medicine far into the future.